Hello, in this webinar, I'm going to be talking about attribution disputes before the courts, by which I mean things to consider if an attribution dispute ends up in litigation and indeed goes to trial. This is not going to be an in-depth analysis of the cases themselves, because a lot of literature has been written about the cases that I'm going to talk about. And of course, one can look at the judgments themselves. It's going to be more of a practical guide primarily from an auction house perspective, based on my experience as Associate General Counsel at Sotheby's for 12 years. Firstly, a word on terminology. I think it's important to distinguish between the terms attribution and authenticity, although the two are often used interchangeably. I have come up with some definitions. They're not formal definitions by any means, and some may disagree with them. But in my view, attribution means determining, if possible, which artist created a particular work or the date of its creation. And authenticity refers to whether a work is genuinely by a particular artist or from a particular date, or is instead a fake created with the intention to deceive as to authorship or date. So although in the process of determining attribution, it might in fact be revealed that a work of art is a fake, that is not always going to be the case. Also, it's worth bearing in mind that attribution is a matter of opinion, and not everyone needs to agree with your opinion. And in fact, your opinion can be proved wrong, but that still doesn't mean that you will lose your case at trial. Both the attribution cases I worked on while at Sotheby's, which I will come on to, were negligence cases, i.e. the claimant said that Sotheby's had been negligent in forming its opinion on attribution. But what is the test for negligence in attribution cases? Well, it's the same as the test for negligence in any other case. Firstly, the claimant must show that a duty of care was owed to them, then that there was a breach of that duty of care, and finally, that that breach caused the claimant loss. The cases in question were Lord Coleridge and Sotheby's about a gold chain of office and Lancelot William Thwaites and Sotheby's about a replica of Caravaggio's The Card Sharps. And in both cases, Sotheby's won. There wasn't really a debate in either case about the fact that Sotheby's owed a duty of care. The question was, whether they had breached that duty of care. Bear in mind that the burden of proof is on the claimant who must prove their case on the balance of probabilities that no reasonably competent auction expert at an international auction house could have arrived at the conclusion reached. And the reason for the square brackets in my slide is because, of course, the defendant might not always be an international auction house. For instance, if the defendant is a local auction house, then they will be judged against the standards of a reasonably competent expert at a comparable local auction house, not an international auction house. Therefore, the nature of the defendant has to be taken into account. And then the question is, what would experts at a comparable establishment have done? And as I mentioned at the beginning, attribution is a matter of opinion. So it won't matter if some of those comparable experts would have reached a different opinion to Sotheby's or the defendant in question. The claimant has to show that none of them would have reached the opinion that Sotheby's did. And Mr. Justice Pelling referred to this in the Lord Coleridge case. He said, in relation to breach, the sole question to be answered is whether Lord Coleridge has proved that the advice that he was given and which he acted upon was advice that no reasonably competent appraiser or valuer working for an international auction house at the date when the advice was given could have arrived at having regard to the material that was in the circumstances reasonably available to such an appraiser. And when you think about it, that is actually quite a difficult burden of proof to meet. Now here is the Coleridge collar. As you can see, it is a gold collar with S-shaped links. So it would have been known as a collar of S's. 
and it was of the sort that would have been worn by the holder of the judicial office known as the Lord Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, an office which is no longer in existence. It was the tradition and belief of the Coleridge family that this collar dated back to Tudor times, whereas it was the opinion of the Sotheby's expert who inspected it that it could not date back earlier than the late 17th century. And by the way, the judge in that case said that Sotheby's expert was entitled to reach that opinion, that it was not unreasonable. The claimants in both the Coleridge and the Thwaites case seem to have an expectation that Sotheby's should have hedged its bets in describing the attribution of the items in question. Now, I would suggest that claimants would do well to look at how auction houses actually catalogue items and describe attributions. Lord Coleridge pleaded two alternative cases. He said that Sotheby's ought to have appraised and valued the collar on the basis that it certainly dated from before 1576 and alternatively that it might possibly have done so. When his counsel was pressed to elaborate on how exactly he thought Sotheby's should have described the collar, this is what was put forward. The date of manufacture is, to a certain extent, uncertain, but the collar is believed to be probably Tudor, rather than dating from any other period, for the reasons set out above. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that attribution to be quite woolly, and I'm not sure that it would entice many buyers. Mr Thwaites, on the other hand, did not assert that the painting was by Caravaggio, but said that Sotheby's should have indicated that it had Caravaggio potential. If you look at the back of a Sotheby's Old Master Paintings auction catalogue, or the catalogue of any other auction house for that matter, you will likely find a glossary of terms showing how they describe categories of attribution, and nowhere will you find Caravaggio potential. You will see that the foremost category is just the name of the artist, which means that in the auction house's opinion, or in this case Sotheby's opinion, this work is a work by the artist. There are various degrees of uncertainty expressed, but not with the phrase potential. As you will see, the lowest category of attribution, as it were, is after the name of the artist, meaning, in Sotheby's opinion, a copy of a known work of the artist. And in actual fact, in the Thwaites case, the painting in question was what Sotheby's believed to be a copy of a very famous composition by Caravaggio. Although they didn't, in fact, catalogue it as after Caravaggio, they catalogued it as follower of Caravaggio because they thought that it was an old copy, a period copy, painted within a certain number of years of Caravaggio's death. And this opinion was fully endorsed by the judge in that case. Both sides in an attribution dispute will naturally seek to find others who support their opinion on the attribution, but you do have to be careful and consider how these other opinions might be viewed by others in the same field or in the market. And this is something that Alex Bell, head of the Old Master Paintings Department at Sotheby's at the time, tried to convey to Mr Thwaites in a letter. He said, It is worth pointing out, however, that an attribution to Caravaggio proposed by any or all of these scholars will not automatically be accepted by the wider art historical community or by the market, by which he meant dealers, museum curators and private collectors. Now this is the point at which the webinar becomes a little bit interactive because I've got a test for you. Here are two paintings, one of which is the undisputed original masterpiece of the card sharps by Caravaggio, and the other is the painting which Mr Thwaites brought in to Sotheby's, which the buyer at auction subsequently declared to be a second original by Caravaggio. Although, as you will recall, Mr Thwaites himself only claimed that Sotheby's should have spotted its so-called Caravaggio potential. So which is which? I will give you a few seconds to decide which is Mr Thwaites' painting and which is the painting by Caravaggio.
Ready for the answer? Well, Mr Thwaites' painting is the one on the left in the slightly more battered looking frame and the painting looks a little bit dirtier and the original in the Kimball Museum is the one on the right. You have to bear in mind, of course, that the experts would have physically inspected Mr Thwaites' painting, so they wouldn't have just looked at images. In case you were fooled by the old frame and the dirty looking nature of the painting, here you can see on the left Mr Thwaites' painting after it had been cleaned and restored. So you can compare the two side by side. And it's worth noting, of course, that Caravaggio's card sharps was extremely popular within his lifetime. So many copies were made while he still lived and then subsequently after his death. During the trial, many, many details of the card sharps painting were analysed. For instance, the dice holder. So the dice holder in Caravaggio's original was compared with how the dice holder was rendered in Mr Thwaites' painting. So here's another little test for you. Which of these dice holders comes from which painting? Well, if you look carefully at the dice holder on the right, dice holder two, you will see that it is leaning slightly and the perspective is a bit awkward, it isn't quite right. Whereas the one on the left is the one in Caravaggio's original, which he has rendered, unsurprisingly, perfectly. Just as a point of reference, I'm going to show you another couple of paintings for comparison, so that you can decide whether the painting on the next slide has more claim to have Caravaggio potential. Although, as we know, that term does not exist in the auction glossary of terms. So the painting that you're looking at now is by Caravaggio. It's in the Palazzo Barberini in Rome, and it is of Judith decapitating Holophanes or Holofernes. And as you can see, it's a very gruesome subject, although beautifully rendered by Caravaggio. This painting is of the same subject as the one by Caravaggio and was discovered in an attic in a house clearance in France. If only we could all find such paintings during this time at home. And it was thought by some to be by Caravaggio. Caravaggio was known to have painted variations of the same theme, although whether he painted identical replicas of his own work is a matter of much debate. This painting was due to be sold at auction last year, but in the end it was sold privately. So have a look and see what you think. This painting was on display in London and if nothing else, I think it's fair to say it is a powerful painting. While I would love to stray off into art historical matters, let's get back to the question at hand, which is how are attribution disputes treated at court? Well, evidence is extremely important. There are three types of evidence, or three primary types of evidence. There are the witnesses, both factual and expert. The factual witnesses are those who were there at the time, who participated in the attribution process or had something to do with it, some input that they can comment on. And the expert witnesses are independent witnesses who give their opinion on the auction house process or on Caravaggio theory scholarship. Then how do you bring the attribution process to life in a courtroom situation? And finally, scientific analysis. How useful is this at trial? We will look at all of these questions now. Now the factual witnesses in an attribution case are a little bit unusual in that although they are there to talk about what they actually did, they are nevertheless experts themselves, experts in their own right and very often renowned in their field. So there is a bit of a crossover there between the factual and the expert and Sotheby's experts, by which I mean the factual witnesses, were subjected to quite a lot of cross-examination on their opinion as experts in either old masters or European sculpture, as the case may be. But there were also independent expert witnesses 
And in an ideal world, these should be comprehensive, comprehensible, balanced and objective. And that was a description Mr Justice Pelling used about one of Lord Coleridge's experts on legal history, who in fact gave evidence which was very helpful to Sotheby's in that he said that in his opinion, the collar of S's would not have been handed down by each holder of the office to the next one, but rather might have been kept for themselves or given to their family in a will. You also have to be careful to press upon the expert witness that firstly their duty is to the court, they are not there to argue on behalf of one side or another, they are there to give an objective opinion to help the court decide and also they should really keep within their realm of expertise and not stray too far out of that and in another case which was actually an authenticity case involving Christie's the judge commented about one of the expert witnesses on occasions he seems to me to have gone further than the evidence justified and also beyond the scope of his considerable expertise he overreached himself to a degree perhaps but how do experts actually arrive at a conclusion on attribution what skills do they use well one of the foremost skills is that of connoisseurship you might have heard talk about the experts eye and this means looking at a painting physically inspecting it and then processing it through one's years of experience comparing it in one's mind to other paintings or works of art that one might have seen and comparing the style and the brush stroke or if it's a work of art its manufacture how it was made until one arrives at at least a preliminary assessment and lay people and lawyers might be surprised at how quickly that process can take place for instance Sotheby's expert in the Coleridge case was criticised for only having spent about 10 minutes inspecting the collar of S's before arriving at her preliminary assessment. But when you think about it, 10 minutes is actually quite a long time to spend with an object. And Mr Justice Pelling said of this, the time required to arrive at such an assessment depended on knowledge and experience. And Mrs Mitchell was knowledgeable and experienced in her field. In fact, she'd been at Sotheby's for over 30 years by this point. Rachel Kaminsky, Sotheby's expert witness on auction house procedure, also conveyed the process that happens that can be used to describe connoisseurship. She said, the intuitive component is what happens during the first few seconds that an expert stands in front of a painting, almost instantaneously, in the blink of an eye, the brain processes years of experience to arrive at a hypothesis or series of hypotheses about a painting. As was revealed in the Thwaites case, in Sotheby's Old Master Paintings Department, they don't just rely on the connoisseurship of one expert, the attribution process is a collective endeavour. They have picture meetings to look at paintings in the Old Master Paintings basement and the painting is inspected by a number of experts who then discuss it together. They will look at it in the dark with an ultraviolet torch and they might apply white spirit which momentarily lifts the dirt so that you can see the brushwork underneath. And how do you get this across at trial? Well, the best way is simply to do these things before the judge. So in the Thwaites case, Sotheby's brought in a 15th century panel painting and demonstrated in front of the judge what would happen if you wiped that painting with white spirit to show her how you could better see the brushwork underneath if you did that. And I think that had a very positive effect the judge was also given an ultraviolet torch and she actually went to see the Thwaites painting, which at this point was hanging at the Museum of the Order of St John in Clerkenwell. It's hung very high up, so Mrs Justice Rose 
had to climb up a, up a ladder, get onto some scaffolding, and she personally inspected the painting with, I think, a normal torch and also the ultraviolet torch, which shows if there has been any recent restoration. So it really helps, I think, to try and recreate some of the attribution process in the courtroom. It has to be said that although a lot of scientific evidence was put forward in both the Coleridge case and the Thwaites case, the connoisseurship evidence and the auction house practice evidence was probably more persuasive in the end. And this may in part have been due to the fact that in both cases, Sotheby's called expert witnesses who had in fact had auction house experience. In the Coleridge case, Charlie Truman had worked at Sotheby's, albeit many, many years before the case. But nevertheless, he could comment knowledgeably about the practice, which hadn't changed that much in the intervening period. And in the Thwaites case, Sotheby's had as their expert Rachel Kaminsky, who had been the head of the Old Master Paintings Department at Christie's in New York. Some people think, nevertheless, that scientific analysis holds the holy grail, the key. And although it can be very helpful, one has to remember that if you do a scientific test, it still has to be interpreted and that that interpretation must in some way be subjective. Mr. Justice Pelling recognised this in the Coleridge case when he said, any benefit from an assay examination, which means determining the carat of gold, depends on deduction from the information that is revealed. And Mrs. Justice Rose said in the Thwaites case that although most scholars would conclude that technical analysis can establish that a painting is not from a particular period or not by a particular artist, its value in establishing a positive dating or attribution is less widely recognised. So there I hope I've given you some ideas to think about. For instance, what do we mean by attribution? The value of practical demonstration. The value also of having experts who have auction house experience, if the case involves an auction house, and the burden of proof for a claimant in such cases. But if you have any other questions, please do feel free to contact me my details are shown on this slide and I'd be happy to answer your questions or advise in any way I can. Thanks for listening.